Space Quest V, The Next Mutation was developed by Dynamics and released in 1993. This was the first Space Quest game not to be developed by both of the two guys from Andromeda, Scott Murphy and Mark Crow. The pair split up and Mark Crow began working on the Space Quest V project as part of Dynamics, a sister company of Sierra Online. The Space Quest series is one of my favorite series of computer games ever, and I recommend checking out my videos on other games in the series if you've never played them before. The basic gist of these games is you play as Roger Wilco, a hapless janitor who manages to save the day through dumb luck and stupidity. The gameplay is centered primarily around puzzle solving elements. Find stuff, use stuff to interact with other stuff and solve a puzzle, move the story forward, maybe die a few times trying to solve a puzzle, repeat. At its core, that's all Space Quest really is, but these puzzle solving elements are set against a rich backdrop of science fiction parody and just plain silly humor. The first three games in the series utilized a text parser, whereas starting with Space Quest 4, they switched to an all point and click interface. The text parser is still my preferred drink of choice when it comes to adventure games, but I will say the point and click works very well for this type of game. You've got all your commands at the top of the screen, such as speak, examine, or use, and you can easily access your inventory. Although some of the puzzles do have a specific time limit, you really don't have to worry about quick reflexes. This is a game you can just kind of sit back and chill with. Space Quest V picks up a few years after the events of the previous games in the series and finds Roger uncovering a sinister plot to dump a bunch of toxic waste, which is causing these people to get all mutated and gooey. The adventure begins with Roger having enrolled in Starcon Academy in hopes of piloting his very own spaceship. The game picks up in the middle of a tense space battle only to realize it was just Roger messing around on the battle simulator again. As with all of these games, the sci-fi and pop culture references are out in full force with a particular lean towards Star Trek this time around. You see Worf in one of the classrooms, the opening theme song is right out of Star Trek the original series, and the game's villain is Rames T. Quirk, an obvious nod to Captain Kirk complete with over-the-top hammy dialogue and toupee jokes. There's other movie references too. The battle simulator looks a lot like the Millennium Falcon. You might see Darth Vader and Obi-Wan duking it out in the hallway. The facehugger from Alien and this guy looks suspiciously like Jabba the Hutt. The security guards are playing missile command and asteroids. Even if you've completed a puzzle in an area, it's fun to just meander around and examine everything to see what kind of wacky stuff the developers put in there. It's all nonsense, and that's one of the things I've always loved about this series. It's never meant to be taken seriously, and would be like if they made space balls into a video game. Anyway, after getting busted on the simulator, Roger realizes he's late for his academy aptitude test. Naturally, you have to cheat on this. Between cheating on the exam and a rat chewing through one of the wires in the exam score database, Roger ends up passing with flying colors and finally manages to achieve his dream of taking command of his very own space cruiser. And of course, his first ship is... A garbage scowl. Oh, Roger, you goof. But Roger tries to make the best of it and tells his crew they're going to be the best garbage scowl in all of StarCon. Actually, this is one of my favorite things about this game is that you really do get to take command of your very own space cruiser and have some degree of freedom here. Okay, so this isn't Mass Effect, but I mean, check this out. You can sit in the captain's chair, you have a crew that you can talk with, you can chat or issue commands. There's even something akin to a dialogue system and all of the characters are interesting. This is a departure from previous games in the series because usually you only see a character for maybe a scene or two. Here, the colorful crew of the Eureka is with you for the entirety of the mission and you also run into other characters such as Beatrice Winkmeister. Yeah, that's her real name. She was mentioned as Roger's future love interest during the time traveling conclusion of Space Quest 4 where Roger meets his future son. One change from part four to part five though is the lack of voice acting. There were plans to release a talky CD version at some point down the line, but with budget cuts and things, they ended up just releasing this on floppy only. Honestly, that's really not a bad thing. Other than Gary Owens, most of the voice actors in Space Quest 4 were pretty bad. You go left and split them up. Mr. Wilco, follow me and do exactly as I say. And even the fantastic Gary Owens started to grate on my nerves by the end of that game. There's just only so many times you can hear, We're glad you could play Space Quest 4. As usual, you've been a real pet load. Getting back to piloting the ship, you've got two crew members with you on the bridge. Flo is your communications officer, and Officer Drool is navigation. You've also got Cliffy down in engineering, who's an obvious nod to Scotty from Star Trek. If you're not sure what you're supposed to be doing, or just weren't paying attention when you got your orders, you can check in with Flo to see what your current mission is, and then talk to Officer Drool to punch in a course. You've got several commands to choose from. Hailing frequencies, light speed, lay in coordinates. If you start pressing buttons on the captain's chair, you can even activate the ship's self-destruct sequence. 
yeah, don't don't do that yet. The game's included spoof Galactic Inquirer magazine serves as a bit of copy protection with numerical coordinates to all the planets you'll be visiting along the way. You won't be able to get through the game without this or some sort of walkthrough that has this information, so just a heads up. Also, you'll want to read through this anyway, because where else will you read stories like Planet Terrorized by Farmers from Earth, Redneck Menace Terrorizes Family, They Made Us Drink Beer and Wear Baseball Caps, Transporter Bloopers, a whole backstory about Roger Wilco. Roger Wilco's disappearance is, to this day, a mystery. This reporter wanted to know what happened to him, so I began asking questions. What I found is that, for the most part, nobody really cares what happened to him. But hey, my editor says I have to fill a whole page with this swill, so... Ah, uh, I miss the old days when computer games came with all sorts of fun stuff like this to read through. Nowadays, you just get a half-baked tutorial built in that everybody probably just skips anyway. So anyway, you punch in your coordinates and it isn't long before you're running into trouble. Turns out the Jipazoid Novelty Company is still ticked off about that Labion Terror Beast mating whistle Roger sent off for in Space Quest 2, so they sent another Terminator to hunt Roger down and kill him. Hey man, the forum said it was free, but that's another thing I love about these games is the references to previous games in the series. There's always little subtle nods or characters that carry over. They sent Arnoid the Android to kill Roger for this in Space Quest 3, and then sent another Terminator in this one. The solution to this puzzle is just awesome. Man, I ain't falling for no banana in my tailpipe. You end up exploring several planets along the way, and that's another great thing about this game is the scenery. This game utilizes the Dynamics graphic engine with VGA graphics and everything looks great. From the interiors of the ships to the planets you travel to, each with their own distinct look. You can even hang out at this cool space bar to give your crew some much needed R&R. The only bad thing about these VGA graphics is that sometimes it's not always apparent what you're supposed to be clicking on. Everything's so chunky and muddled. Occasionally items in the background could be a little blurry and unless you happen to click on it, you wouldn't even know you're supposed to do something with it. Like, would you guess this is a computer console? that you're supposed to interact with, or that this is actually a button in the hallway of your ship that you're supposed to press? That's a minor complaint, and those of you that watch this show regularly know I'll always prefer simple EGA graphics over these more complex VGA graphics, but it is what it is. I promise I'm not going to sit here and explain to you for 10 minutes why Space Quest 3 was better. No, really, I... Well, okay, the music here isn't as good either. This game's soundtrack isn't bad at all, and some of the sound effects are actually quite good, such as the ship skidding around in light speed... <laughs> And did they straight up lift Homer Simpson here? No! There's also a lot of ambient noises that are fun, such as when you're on the bridge of the Eureka. Yeah, that's totally the bridge of the Enterprise. But most of the musical tunes aren't nearly as memorable as tracks from earlier games in the series. I do especially like this riff on the familiar Space Quest theme overheard when you're wandering around the Starcon Academy base, though. I also felt like the puzzle elements in this game were a little more forgiving than some of the earlier games in the series. This is a longer game, definitely the longest in the series up to this point, but it's not an overwhelmingly difficult game. The puzzles all make sense for the most part, and that's actually a good thing. Like here, for instance, when you're trying to help Cliffy, your engineer, escape from jail after he gets in a bar fight, you can use the alien facehugger because he spits acid that you can use to melt through the bars. And that totally makes sense because if you're a fan of Alien, you know these little boogers bleed acid, and even if you don't, earlier in the game you have to track the facehugger down because he keeps burning holes in the floor of your ship. It also seems like there weren't nearly as many ways to die this time around, which you may think is a good thing or bad thing depending on how you look at it. I I miss some of the more over-the-top madcap deaths from earlier games in the series, whereas this time I actually had to really scratch and dig for different ways to die. But on a positive note, gone are some of the more frustrating dead ends like what I griped about in Space Quest 4, where you could potentially make it three quarters of the way through the game, only to realize you have to backtrack to an earlier save because you missed some crucial item. This game is much more straightforward and accessible for established adventure game fans or first-timers new to the genre. That is, until you get to the last part of the game. When you get 
get to the end game, you have to infiltrate the Goliath, a massive Starcon space cruiser that's been overrun by mutants. At first, there's a really cool sequence where you have to fly an EVA pod up to the hole of the Goliath and then find a way inside. But after that, you're left to explore the interiors of the Goliath, trying to find your way to the bridge. You sneak into the air ducts, and then the whole thing turns into a twisted maze where every passage looks the same. This part just seems to go on forever if you don't know what you're doing. There's no clues or hints up to this point regarding the layout of the Goliath, so you just have to figure it out for yourself. This is right up there with the maze of twisty little passages all alike from Colossal Cave Adventure, and if you don't know what that's all about, eh, go play Colossal Cave Adventure and get back to me. In general, I always recommend not using a walkthrough for these types of games, and it's much more fun to genuinely try to figure out the puzzles for yourself, except for this maze. Grab a walkthrough long enough to get through the maze and then put it away for the ending. You have my permission. Thankfully, the game's final sequence makes up for it with a nice satisfying conclusion. Roger saves everyone from the gooey puke monsters, gets the girl, and even gets a chance to take command of the mighty SCS Goliath for a fleeting moment of cathartic victory, all while sticking it to that jerkwad Rames T quirk. Way to go, Wilco! If you're a fan of Space Quest or point-and-click adventure games, Space Quest V is absolutely worth your time and can be found on the cheap in places like Steam or GOG. I do recommend using ScumVM over DOSBox to play these old games on modern computers though, and I'll put a link in the description with some more info on that if you're interested. As always, thank you for watching, please don't text and drive, and I'll see you next time on Friday Night Arcade.